You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's guest, who has a 20-year military career spanning Vietnam and through some of the most noted units in military history in the Army. Get to that in a moment. But first, just a few words about our promotion with Amazon, as I forgot. I can't believe that. Our promotion with Amazon on our website, hazardground.com. Best place to go before you do your Amazon shopping. You can click on that Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the sponsors tab. Uh, and you do all your normal Amazon shopping. Our website will direct you right there. We'll get a percentage of whatever you guys spend, and we will donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground as well. It works right from your smartphone. Very simple, very convenient, and takes you right to the Amazon app. So all of your credit card information is saved. But just go to hazardground.com first and link through Amazon that way. Don't forget to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground and Hazard Ground Podcast. And of course, continue the Apple reviews. Uh, we are getting more and more every week, getting closer and closer to getting at least a thousand in there, trying to crack that top 100 Apple podcast. Super important to us, helps us grow this hazard ground community and get more of these amazing stories out to everybody. So really simple, really easy. Again, you can do it from your smartphone, uh, wherever you get your Apple podcasts, just go leave a short review, give us five stars, tell us why you love the show. And if you're lucky, we'll, get, <laughs> we'll put it on our social media. Yes, if you're very, very lucky. All right. Uh, this week's guest, is a 21-year member of the United States Army and a retired lieutenant colonel. Uh, his career started out early in the mid-60s uh, from becoming a ranger onto Vietnam with Mac V. Sog, went on to some of the most notable units in military history, including being an instructor at Ranger School, 2nd Infantry Division in Korea, in Korea, and the 18th Airborne Corps, and eventually went on to be an instructor at Army ROTC at the University of Georgia. He is Lieutenant Colonel Retired Dick Thompson joining us here on the Hazard Ground. Dick, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Mark, for having my story here. Uh, very excited about talking to you tonight. No, we're, we're excited to talk to you. Listen, anytime you get somebody uh, who, who, with the letters Mac V. Sog uh, attached to their name, there, there's, there's some stories there to tell, to say the least. But it's pretty impressive when you look back on your career and serving some of the most noted units that I talked about, even being an instructor at several points throughout your career. Um, you know, is, is the instructor portion of it as rewarding as people would think? I, I thought it was. I had had an opportunity to share knowledge, but whenever I'm around students, I also see an opportunity to learn. So I tried to learn as much as I could from the students. They're all bringing in a different perspective, different uh, experiences and background. So I, I took a lot of notes. Uh, I also had an opportunity to try different things sometimes. I mean, we had a certain protocol we had to follow, but um, you know, you, you had some freedom to move around. So I you know, trained special forces, I trained uh, rangers and, you know, a lot of other people. So I uh, really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. All right. Go back to the beginning though. Uh, you enlisted in the mid sixties, uh, just as Vietnam was sort of surging. Uh, how does that whole story go? Uh, I was going to school on a, a chemistry scholarship. So I had um, gotten a, a chemistry set when I was 13. Uh, before that, I, my plan was military. I wanted to go into Rangers. I came from a military family. But once I got the chemistry set and started, uh, you know, swapping brains between frogs and uh, birds and things like that and trying to get them to work and working on their hearts, uh, eventually building rockets, building a lot of different explosives, um, it got pretty excited, you know, about chemistry. I got a scholarship to University of South Carolina, so I wanted to be a research chemist. Uh, but then, you know, like you said, the, the war was really surging. You listen to it on the news every night, and what you heard was, uh, these guys can't last much longer. Uh, we're going to win this. It's going to end soon. Uh, and I'm thinking that, you know, if, if I wait until I finish school, uh, it'll be over. 
and I'm going to miss out on my opportunity to be patriotic, to get to be in the military. So I decided to take a break from college, enlist, go in, go to Vietnam, and then you know come back and finish school. So the enlisting route uh, was more about you just wanting to do this as opposed to avoiding the draft. We've talked to a lot of Vietnam vets who, who went down the road of, well, if I enlist, there's a, there's a sense that I could sort of control some of my own destiny as opposed to being drafted. Was any of that a part of the, the thought process as well? Uh, mostly it was that I want to get in now, you know, while it's still uh, going on and be able to go over and, and do it. I, um, you know, I had thought about Rangers and I could do that, you know, enlisted, but my plan was three years and out. So I, the officer was never on my, uh, you know, my radar when I went in. So how does that come about? I mean, you complete the basic and advanced infantry courses, right? And then yeah. you end up at OCS. What was there? What was that decision? Well, it started in uh, basic training. You know, the drill sergeant I had made me the, um, the platoon guide, you know, right away when he saw what I could do. You know, I was uh, in, you know, really good physical condition. I'd been a hunter or a tracker. I mean, marksmanship, shooting guns, weapons, things like that. I mean, that was that was my thing. And the more I got in basic training, uh, the more excited I got. So, I, he suggested that I should go to OCS and it kind of encouraged me to go that way. I got the same encouragement uh, when I was in advanced infantry training and got orders to go to OCS after that. And, uh, you know, everything worked out well. What was the uh, uh, reaction from some of your, your fellow soldiers when you decided to go to OCS? Well, I had had several friends that I had met either in basic training or during advanced infantry training um, who were going the same route. You know, we were all thinking the same way. We wanted to go uh, special forces. We wanted to be an officer. We wanted to be ranger. Uh, you know, so I had a lot of support and guys that actually got, we never left each other for almost two years until we got to Vietnam. I mean, it was amazing how some of us stayed together. Then the army, uh, at least when I was in, tended to like to do things uh, alphabetically. So I had friends who had names that started with S's or T's. And, um, you know, we ended up together every time we turned around. So it worked out great for us. Now, after commissioning, your first assignment is at the Army Special Warfare School. But when do you get uh, SF qualified. When do you become a Green Beret in there, all this? Well, as soon as I finished OCS, then I went to airborne school. Okay. You had to had to be airborne qualified to, to go to the uh, Green Beret training. So as soon as I finished that, I was assigned to Fort Bragg. I was assigned 3rd Special Forces Group. Uh, and then while I was in there, they sent me to the qualification course. So I went through the qualification course, came back to uh, third group. I was put on a team that was training to go on a mission to Africa. Uh, I had volunteered to um, go to ranger school. I volunteered to go to uh, Vietnam. So the ranger school orders came came up. I got to go to ranger school and immediately followed by orders to Vietnam. Wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of schooling packed in a short amount of time. Yeah. I mean, and, and is it is it common that you would get to a SF unit before going to, um, you know, the Q course and everything else like that? I mean, back then was it was that sort of a route that people took? Uh, a lot of people did. They would assign you to group, uh, and then once you got there, they would slot you into the Q course, and you would go go through it. You know, as soon as the slot came open, they put you in it. Um, which kind of gave you priority because you were already there and assigned. Um, you would see people with with their braids on, but their uh, the they would have a little slash kind of patch across uh, their beret rather than than the full uh, flash. So you could tell those people were not qualified yet. Uh, but you still got to train. You jumped out of planes. You still did a lot of marksmanship training and different things until your uh, slot came open and you got to go. 
So you had to Vietnam uh, in September of 68 as part of Mac VSOG. And for those who don't know, Mac VSOG, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, Studies and Observation Group. <clears throat> Um, and so give everybody the background on what Mac VSOG is and sort of what the mission set was for it. Well, <clears throat> you went there uh, with a special forces assignment. And at the end of the end process for special forces, uh, you, you were asked a question. Um, and and the, the guy was talking to you, said, I've been through your file. <clears throat> you volunteered to come in the army. You volunteered for, you know, uh, OCS and special forces and ranger school and Vietnam. Now you have an opportunity uh, to volunteer for the probably the most important assignment you'll ever have in your career. Uh, and I asked him if he was talking about SOG because I had heard the term, but no one really knew what those guys did. And he said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And I said, well, I, I need to know what they do. And he said, well, the only thing I can tell you is that you'll be volunteering to go anywhere and do anything and not tell anyone about it for 20 years. <laughs> and I, I said, well, then I'm your guy. You know, when I they say 20 years, though, I mean, is, yeah. do you ch I mean, I chuckle at it when I hear it. Like, it seems so in unrealistic. I know, it, it, but, you know, to a, a young guy, you know, or 20-year-old guy, I mean, that sounds, th that must be really cool. You can't even tell me what it is I'm going to go do, except I'm going to be in the most elite combat unit in the world. I'm going to be part of that. Yeah, I can go do that. And you want me to sign a non-disclosure statement? I mean, you had, you had the documents there. So you signed a non-disclosure statement. It said you wouldn't tell anyone about what you did, where you went uh, for 20 years. You couldn't talk about it. You also signed another one that said, I'm volunteering to go on a minimum of six missions or six months, whichever comes first, before you know I can be released. So, now, yeah. I mean, did guys turn this down? Oh, what, yeah. What, what, it, yeah. What was the reason people turned it down? Just the uncertainty of it? Well, like before, before I went over for the in-processing, I, I had a friend who was already in Vietnam, and he and I were in a, in a bar talking that night, and he said, tomorrow, at the end of the day, they're going to ask you if you want to join SOG, and said, I'm telling you now, say no, do not volunteer for SOG. First of all, the majority of them get killed, the ones who don't get killed get the crap shot out of them, and they come back as nutcases. Do not volunteer for SOG. Well, I mean, that kind of pushed me right on over that way because that sounded pretty cool. So, um, yeah, it, it, the highest casualty rate in Vietnam was in SOG. If you were a SOG operator, uh, you were either going to get killed or you would be wounded at least once, if not multiple times. Um, I mean, when you'd go on a mission and you came back and you were just wounded, that was great. You thought, man, that was a successful mission. They wounded me, but they didn't kill me. So, you know, I'll heal up and go back out there again. I mean, that that's the draw. That's it's crazy, Dick. Like, that's the draw yeah. for you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I... I wanted to be in the Rangers. I wanted to be in the elite. I want to play with the big boys. Uh, and if this is what the big boys do, then I'm here. You know. So when you when you get to Vietnam, what is? I mean, give us the experience and like what they're telling you. So you didn't know anything about the mission and what you were doing. What did you hear about SOG when you actually landed in Vietnam? I, you know, just from my friend, don't do it. Just don't do it. Uh, right, but I mean, like when you when you got to Vietnam and you got your mission set for what SOG was going to do, what was that? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> well, when I went ahead and signed the papers, he told me uh, where to be the next day um, at the airfield, at 1300, uh, to go to uh, up to Da Nang. So. When I, I got down to the airfield, I went to the restricted end of the airfield uh, where the black C-130s 
landed and came to and it was restricted no one could go there so i got in what was called blackbird a, a blackbird uh flew up close to denang and it, you know there were no seats in the aircraft seat belts on the floor but nothing in the aircraft um crew chief told me that you know fast and tight because when we take off we're going to go vertical almost immediately uh and when we land we're going to come down nose first until just before we get to the runway and we'll flare out and land uh, because we have to avoid you know getting shot down on the way up here um, when i got off i was told uh, there'll be a bus here to pick you up in a few minutes the black school bus pulled up all the windows were shot out probably 200 or more bullet holes that i could see uh, in the bus the seats were all shot apart um and so the only asked, thing you're thinking is, yes, this is what I asked for. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I, I, maybe this wasn't such a great decision. <laughs> oh, now um, it finally so, comes to you. Yeah. It wasn't so a great I asked, decision. I asked the driver, or I said, <laughs> so what's with all the bullet holes? And he said, well, there's a there's a pass that we have to go through on, on the way to headquarters. And uh, it's not uncommon for us to get ambushed when we go through there. But don't worry. We're also picking up a a SOG team here, uh, just do whatever they tell you if anything happens. So in a few minutes, just almost out of another dimension, you know, I see seven guys up here, and I, I'd never seen anybody dress like them before. Uh, no name tags, no dog tags, no ID, uh, you know, a, a triangular bandage tied around their head. They had weapons I hadn't seen before. They had just, you know, grenades and all kinds of ammunition and stuff hanging all over them. Uh, a couple of them had uh, M79 grenade launchers that they had cut down so that it, the barrel was just barely longer, you know, than the projectile. The stock was cut off, so it was like a pistol. A uh, couple of them had those. They had you know, really cool looking weapons. Uh, but when you looked at those guys, they made the hair stand up on the back of your neck. You could tell there were no nonsense. The guy that was walking at the end of the line walked backwards all the way to the bus, looking to the rear uh, as if he was expecting someone to come up from behind. They got on the bus. They all took up defensive positions inside the bus. Uh, the guy that appeared to be the team leader said, if anything happens, you get on the floor. Do not get up until I tell you to. Roger that. I, you know, I can do that. And then, you know, we, we go. Uh, there was no ambush. And I could tell they were not happy. They were really hoping they were going to get ambushed on the way back to the camp. But And when they got off the bus at the camp, it was like they walked through another dimension. They just disappeared. And I thought, wow, you know, in a few days, I'm going to be on a team like that. I mean, that's, that's uh, really cool. So, yeah, uh, so that I got mean, me up there. <laughs> I was going to say that's, that's right up your alley, right? That's, that's what you were yeah. hoping for. Um, yeah. So what is the first person like, what's the first conversation you had with somebody who was in SOG at that point in time? I mean, I know the team leader spoke to you on the bus, but like, did you talk to anybody when you got back to base or anything? Well, I had an escort, you know, the, that picked me up uh, at the bus, took me to the quarters, uh, and he said, you know, I'm, this is where you're going to stay tonight, and I'm going to take you to the mess hall, you know, get you fed. I said, what about a weapon? I don't have a weapon. Uh, and his response was, sorry about that. Um, if you stay here, you will be issued a weapon tomorrow. If not, you'll be issued a weapon uh, when you get where you're going. So he took me out. He showed me the bunker to go to uh, if the siren went off for incoming that night. So I, you know, at least I knew where to go. I got a good meal. Uh, he said, we have this little movie theater set up, some, some bleachers, uh, a couple of pieces of plywood nailed together and painted white, and we show movies there most nights if it's not raining. said, you might want to go see the movie tonight. So after I ate, I went over uh, and had a seat in the bleachers. Behind the screen, 
was Marble Mountain, sticking 450 feet up, straight up in the air out of the sand, about 250 meters outside our perimeter. Um, so I'm watching a John Wayne movie, and all of a sudden, it looked like a 4th of July demonstration on the mountain. Red tracers, green tracers going everywhere, explosions, flares going off. I dive out of the bleachers. I'm face first in, in the sand. And everybody else is watching the movie. So I asked the guy, so what's going on? And he, he said, oh, sorry about that, Lieutenant. Um, this happens every night. It's not a big deal. Um, you know, the, the North Vietnamese are trying to take our two ob or, uh, combat op uh, post off of the mountain. Um, they do this every night. but They won't shoot down here. They just shoot at each other. And pretty soon, the two teams that are out, up there will kill the NBA. And then the rest of the night, you'll just hear some sporadic sniper fire going at the, at the teams. But uh, just enjoy the movie. You'll get your turn on the mountain. So, okay, thank you. So do you remember your first mission? Yeah. So um, our mission was, was going to be a wiretap. We were going to be put inside of, of Laos next to a highway that uh, had a wire, telephone wire running along the highway. Our mission was to go there, uh, attach, attach a uh, wiretap device so that we could record the conversations going on uh, across that wire. So we were going in to do that. We were gonna be inserted uh, at just before last light. So in a seven man team, and we were all on the same uh, helicopter. And they had said we were gonna start out at 3000 feet. Uh, we were gonna descend rapidly uh, down and do a short final, go into a bomb crater that had been uh, blown in the canopy. So I got a 30 second warning. I didn't quite know what that meant, but all of a sudden the aircraft banked hard to my side. Uh, I'm at 3,000 feet. I'm hanging on to the aircraft with one hand. Nothing else is touching the aircraft. I'm looking down at the canopy and thinking, holy cow, um, I may fall out of this thing before I get there. And we spiral down in an auto rotation. He flares it out, slows it down. We go right across the, the tops of the canopy over to this hole. We settle straight down into this bomb crater and we're about 10 feet from the ground <clears throat> that's a, as far as we're going to be able to go i've got on 80 pounds of equipment uh and thinking i'm going to hit pretty hard you know when i jump down this this last um, you know six or seven feet here and i'm on the skids the other american next to me is on the skid and i bent my knees to jump and just the second before I jumped, I saw a guy pop up on my right, about 10 feet away from me with a AK-47. So instead of jumping into the crater with him, I jumped back on the floor of the helicopter. He you know, went automatic with his AK. The bullets came right across where my legs had been a fraction of a second before, hit the guy next to me, hit him in the leg. So he starts to fall. I put a half a magazine into that guy. Uh, that triggered the whole ambush. They were all the way around the bomb crater. So they open up on us. Um, I grabbed the, the other guy that was next to me by the back of his load bearing gear so he couldn't fall into the crater and go ahead and take another guy out of the tree with, with the other half magazine. Got the American back up. Blood's going everywhere. I've got two of you know, my indigenous mercenaries one on each side of me with their car 15s on automatic you know 800 rounds a minute coming out of that the door gunner on my side with his m60 is is wide open we had two cobra gunships that were coming in with us uh they both opened up with their mini guns so you got four thousand rounds coming down from them looks like a two red hose pipes you know squirting uh into the jungle there you have 30 to 40 NVA who have opened up on us with their AKs. Um, bullets are coming everywhere. There's nothing, you know, between us but air uh, and them. 
So it, it got a little hairy there for um, uh, uh, you think? two seconds. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, I've trained for two years to do this. I came over here to accomplish something, and I'm going to get killed in the first 15 seconds. It sounds this about is, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is this is not a good deal. I mean, this is this is not what I plan to do. You know, I wanted to take take out a bunch of these guys. Um, and then I started to discover things. One is when, you know, we had six magazines stuffed inside of a canteen pouch. That's how we carried the 20 round magazines. I, I discovered that when your stress level is that high, it's hard to get your fine motor coordination to work. It's hard to get a magazine that's stuck in a pouch out especially when your hand, whole hand is covered with blood and it's slick and you can't get the magazine out and people are shooting at you. And finally I get it out. And then I realized trying to get it in the magazine. Well, with all those bullets coming at me, that was more difficult than I ever had when I was just training, you know, because people weren't shoot. They didn't shoot at me. Um, but finally got it in there and began to, you know, get with the program and started taking, you know, some people out, uh, eventually, we lifted up out of the, you know, the hole in the canopy. And, you know, I looked over at the, I had to be the number two guy, regardless of rank at that time. I looked over at the team leader, and he looked back at me, big grin on his face, and he gave me a thumbs up. And I'm thinking, he really enjoyed that. <laughs> I mean, he thought that was really cool. I thought we were all going to die. That was just uh, day one for you, right? That was mission one for you. Yeah, that was. <laughs> the yeah. fun was just so, to get it. So we get back, we get on the ground, and I go over to him and I said, So, just out of curiosity, how many magazines did you you fire while we were down in the hole? And he said, You know, I emptied five. I was almost empty with my six. I threw two fried grenades and I threw a smoke grenade as we were coming out. And he said, Lieutenant, if you don't learn to change magazines faster when people are shooting at you, you're going to die. I, I said, I can believe that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, I just didn't quite realize it was going to be like that, but I'll practice. For what sure. Was, was every mission that dense and that, you know, uh, firefight filled? Eventually every mission was, it was just going to be a disaster at some point. Um, I mean, when, when you go out on a mission and you're taking a seven man team out and your mission is to go find a 500 man NVA battalion and decimate them, uh, it's not hard to find them, but you know, you got to stay alive long enough when you do find them to be able to get <clears throat> your air assets out there and start pounding them and then eventually work get away from them. Uh, fight your way back to an LZ that you can come out on, destroying as many of them as you can as you come back. Um, and, you know, 500 was a small amount to go out and look for. I mean, the largest group that I went after was a 10,000-man uh, NVA regiment. And again, I had, I had seven people. Um, but, you know, we had... A, a lot of air support. Eventually, we had the B-52 strikes come in, but you know they, they were those guys were decimated over a period of two days. But you know, I fractured my spine and two vertebrae. We got shot down at the last minute coming into the LZ. Um, you know, so crashed a helicopter. Uh, had a bunch of things like that going on. So the, the missions all got really intense, and you, and well, particularly as a leader. Today. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. When you do, when you, when every mission is like that, do you get desensitized to any of it? Like the, the guy who thought, "Oh my God, I'm going to get killed in 15 minutes here." After you do three, four, five of those, and it's just that way all the time, do you get desensitized to that feeling? Well, I, what I had to do was I had to get to the point where uh, I just had to ignore the bullets. If you're thinking about all those bullets that are coming at you all the time, you can't do anything. My job was to lead the team, direct the team, direct the airstrikes, get everything in there. Uh, but if I was worried about a bullet hitting me, you know, every second, I, I couldn't do that. So I just had to set those aside. I had to do what I needed to do. I had to get down. I had to crawl. 
I had to fight, and you know, I uh, I like to shoot. I mean, if you're going to shoot at me, I, I'm going to shoot back at you. I mean, I carried 50 magazines of ammunition with me when we were going on a mission. That's a lot of rounds. Um, a lot of rounds. Yeah. So you're constantly playing hide and seek when you're severely outmanned. <clears throat> um, what's that like? I mean, it, 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 as you said, it's hard to find. But I mean, in the same respect, you know, it's it's find them or be found, and there is a strategic advantage to being the finder versus the findee, right? Yeah, but it's it's all you also have an advantage of being small, quick, sure. and quiet. So you know that was an advantage that we had. We knew we were there. We knew what we were looking for. Uh, we had our tactics to to try to find you. Um, and, you know, we didn't move at night. They did. You move at night, you're going to make noise. You just can't move through there without making noise. And if you make noise, we know where you are. And we don't do anything, you know, unless you walk up on us. If you step on one of us, then we'll take you out. But we're going to be very quiet. Uh, if we do make contact with you, we start with area weapons like claymores. Man, I'd love to have seven claymores, you know, hooked together so I can detonate them, you know, simultaneously. That's 10 and a half pounds of C4, 4,900 steel balls, and it's coming at you very quickly. And and you don't know where we are. You don't know where we set it off from. Uh, so I would do things like that. I'd have other layers. Uh, we would have claymores. We'd use time fuses. We'd leave them behind us, you know, with a 30-second, 60-second time fuse. So if you're assaulting down trying to get us, all of a sudden a claymore goes off. That gets your attention. I mean, they were people, too. They didn't want to they, they didn't want to die, but they also wouldn't quit. They were determined to come get you. But, you know, they're still people. And, you know, if you hit them with claymores, you hit them with fragmentation grenades. I mean, my little team. If I had a seven-man team, we had 70 frag grenades with us. You know, so we could chunk a lot of grenades out toward them. We had a lot of ammunition. We had to survive until the gunships arrived, till the F-4s arrived, the A-1Es arrived, and then we could start smoking the whole place. And was there was there any mission where it was just straight recon, no, you know, desire to or no requirement to engage? Uh, there were missions where that's what you were supposed to do. It was just hard to stay out there, uh, you know, for very long without them finding you. Right. I mean, if you're out there for five days, th they saw the helicopters come in. And if the helicopters come in and land in the clearing, they assume a team must have gotten off there. Uh, I mean, there's documentation that shows that the North Vietnamese had – approximately 50,000 highly trained soldiers working in Cambodia trying to find SOG teams. The, their mission in life was to find us and destroy us. You know, so they're out there looking, and they got smarter as time went along. You know, the latter part of 69, they knew our techniques. I mean, we had all kinds of problems uh, trying to get away from them. They were getting our radio frequencies. Uh, you know, so it, it made it much more difficult to be out there and not not be in contact. I, I, as you've already stated, there were several close calls uh, to you being injured or killed. Do you have a closest of close calls? I, I mean, is there a ranking order of, you know, I was this close to dying. I was second most close to dying, third most close to dying, if that's the right way to phrase it. <laughs> yeah, I think... I think every mission I was close. Yeah. But some missions I might be close several times, you know, in that one mission that I knew about. I mean, where I was being hit with shrapnel. Um, you know, I've got a streak down the top of my head where a big chunk uh, just went right across the top of my head into a tree. I mean, I there was a time when I I thought I wanted to be taller. I mean, my little brother is six four. Oh. I thought, man, th that would be cool to be that tall. I'd be dead. 
there were so many times that if I'd have been a quarter of an inch taller, I wouldn't be here. You know, so so being a little shorter, you know, worked to my advantage. Uh, being small, being fast, uh, you know, helped me out. And, and then I'm sure I had a lot of help from above to um, make little luck never hurt no one. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so when, I used up a lot of lives. Yeah, I, w- I would say so. When does the Vietnam deployment end for you? Um, it ended right at uh, in December. So I came back. Uh, I had the month of December, you know, to to start recovering and and then reported into uh, the ranger department at Fort Benning uh, and we got assigned to the mountain camp up at Dahlonega, Georgia. So and that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to work in the mountains because, you know, I just spent a year in the mountains. Uh, so I was used to going up and down hills and I liked that kind of terrain and you know, my expectation was eight months in the States and then back to SOG. So, you know, I'd been told that's your expected turnaround time is about eight months. And and then going back to SOG. So, I, you know, I mentioned to you before about being an instructor gave me an opportunity to learn more. Because a lot of these guys coming through ranger school, I mean... <laughs> they're not brand new soldiers coming in the army. These guys were experienced. I mean, uh, I don't know if you know uh, the name Bob Howard, Bob Howard, Medal of Honor winner from SOG. I mean, he came through Ranger School when I was there as an instructor. So, I mean, you got guys coming in there that, you know, big time heroes, experienced, and you can learn from them and you talk to them and you watch them. And I took notes the whole time i started the journal to say when i go back to sog i've got to be better than i was when i was there the first time was there a um noticeable difference between the people who came through ranger school when you were an instructor as opposed to when you were a student when i was a student when i was a student the people going through ranger school uh were very hungry the rules changed right after I came back and became an instructor. When I went to ranger school, uh, one of the rules was if you were a ranger student, you had to get fed at least one meal every three days. If you were the patrol leader or the patrol leader for your your team when you were out, uh, if if he forgot to order a resupply of food, Or if the team that went to pick up the resupplies forgot to ask specifically for the food, they would carry all the ammunition back to the team, but no food. So you didn't get to eat that day. Uh, When I got there, uh, it was chained. So you had to you had to feed them at least one meal a day. So, you know, they they took some of the some of the hardship out of it. it still wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you you had to had to have a meal a day. You had to have, I think, three hours sleep a night and things like that. So um, I know you said you learned a lot from them, but what was like the, the one sort of theme or the one sort of idea that you kept having to, to beat into Ranger uh, Ranger School um, candidates heads, you know, from what you learned in SOG? trying to teach them that it would help them out either through the course or down the road when they would deploy self-awareness. You've got to be self-aware. You've got to be situationally aware. You have to know where you are. You have to know how you're functioning right now. And if you have, if you're having a problem, you need to be able to tell your ranger buddy or your partner, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling here. I can't keep my eyes open or watch me, you know, don't let me do something stupid. Um, and the same thing in SOG. When you went out there, I ate uh, at most one meal a day. Um, I had <laughs> I had some medication uh, before I went that would help me not have to go to the potty while I was out there. Uh, couldn't afford to to be out there with my pants down. Uh, so there are things like that. As a team leader, I also carried a, a medical kit that 
if things really got rough and you were being chased for two or three days and you had to stay awake, uh, you had, you know, some stuff uh, to help keep you awake. Um, you know, I had morphine. If you got wounded, if, you know, if I had morphine I could give you. I I had, you know, various drugs. Every every SOG member had um, an IV that they carried with them. They had their own personal IV. It was in a, a little uh, container that we taped onto the, the back of our load-bearing equipment. Uh, and I used to make my guys when we were in camp practice giving IVs. They did not like that. But I told them, I said, you know, if I get hit, I don't want the first time you give an IV to be why you're getting shot at. And I'm laying there bleeding to death. Uh, we're going to practice this so that we all know what we're doing and how to do it, uh, at least when we're not being shot at. So we've got some idea of what to do. And I, I tried to make the training as realistic as possible. Um, I talked to the guys about the impact of sleep. Because one of the things is that, you know, I uh, asked myself very quickly in SOG was, why do these people do this? Why am I doing this? And, you know, if, if I don't get killed, I'm only going to do it for a year. But my people, my mercenaries, they do this all the time. I'm going to leave. They're still going to be on the team, still going out there. And they get their 50% scar tissue. So I, I started thinking about maybe, maybe when I go back to school, maybe chemistry is not what I need to be looking at. <laughs> maybe, maybe I need to, to change to psychology and see if I can understand what motivates people to do this. Uh, how do I, as a leader, motivate people? How do I make good decisions? How do I deal with it, with all the stress that's out here? So, you know, when I eventually did get to go back to school, well, I changed over to psychology, and that's what I, I began studying. All right. So you were an instructor for what? Almost four years. Is that how long you last there? A uh, little over three. What okay. happened? What happened was, you know, the eight months that came up, just like they said, I got orders to go back to Vietnam. There were probably twenty of us uh, that got orders to go back to Vietnam. Uh, I signed out on my 30-day leave to get ready to go, and then uh, I was contacted and said, your orders have been changed. Go back to Dahlonega, go back to Ranger School. Um, and when I asked why, they said, well, in order to be an instructor for Ranger training, you have to have had combat experience. And what's happening right now, people are getting out of the Army so fast after Vietnam we just don't have enough people with combat experience uh, to be instructors. So we're going to keep you there for a while. So they sent us all back. We continued to be instructors, you know, for a while longer. Uh, and then I went to the infantry officer advanced course from there. Uh, and then went to the second ID and uh, had uh, what the general called a provisional ranger company there. So he let me run that. So that was pretty cool. Um, were you were you frustrated that that's the way it went down? I was that I had to wait that long, you know, because I was psyched to go back, uh, to go back to SOG. And all of a sudden, you know, I was still training, but I thought, well, you know, there's still more I can learn. Um, but, you know, while I was there, um, you know, one of the guys that I had worked for in SOG was a guy called Dick Meadows. And I don't know if you've run across him or not. I mean, he's just special ops legend. I mean, there's a big bronze statue to him at Fort Bragg. Um, but, you know, he called me. Um, and, and a few months after I was at Ranger School and he said, look, uh, I need some help. You're going to get... Um, temporary duty orders here in the next few days. Uh, just go ahead and make arrangements to be gone for about six months or so. That's all I can tell you. Um, so I, I got orders to go TDY, uh, and then the orders got revoked because the head of the Ranger Department 
uh, flipped out when, uh, you know, Meadows had gotten pulled out of the ranger department. Another guy, Benning, had gotten pulled out. And I came down on orders to be pulled out. And about six months later, headlines in the paper was uh, the United States invades uh, North Vietnam, Sante Raid. So I had missed that. Uh, so, you know, I had been excited that I might get to do something, you know, really cool like that, but then I missed it. That was very frustrating. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, that ends up being your long trip to Vietnam, right? The one that you had? Yeah. So I didn't get wow. to go back. That is, uh, uh, I, I guess for you, unfortunate, but um, fortuitous. I mean, when you realize what you had done the first time, going back the second time must have seemed almost like a suicide mission. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of the ones when I was there. In fact, we had yeah. some I mean, missions. We call suicide like, missions. <laughs> you got out so, like, not even relatively unscathed. Like, you got out unscathed um, for the most part without any wounds, right? No, and so, like, no, I, you know, like I mentioned before, I uh, fractured spine. You know, so I had a broken back. I had you know fractured vertebrae different things like that. You know, I got scars all over me where they pull shrapnel out of me. Um, I got actually, I mean, we, we wore no, no armament. Right. So you, all you had was a jungle fatigue shirt. No, to try I, to but stop I guess bullets, but you know, I was going to say, I, I'm sorry. what I meant was like, you know, bullets or, or shrapnel in you, like you managed to avoid all that, right? Yeah. In a fortuitous way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got shot four times in the back with an AK, different times. They went in the radio because I carried my own radio and the radio stopped it. I got hit with a big piece of shrapnel right at the heart. That's where I carried my survival radio and that shrapnel beard itself uh, in my survival radio. Man. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, and I had a lot of small pieces I broke. I broke ribs on several occasions. I took all the meat off of, of the skin and everything off the inside of both hands uh, on one mission. I, you know, I was injured, wounded a lot. I just didn't have bullets penetrate me that often. So I was going to say, did you check your, your ass for a four leaf clover at some yeah. point? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I, I was very fortunate. Yeah. I mean, I, I um, had a lot of things happen. After after 2ID in Korea, uh, you head over to 18th Airborne Corps. Are, are these assignments that you're going to? It uh, looks like you were a training officer there, and this is, you know, post-Vietnam. Um, and then you stay there as part of in the 18th Airborne Corps as part, as part of the Emergency Readiness Deployment Evaluator for SF and Ranger units. I mean, like, are, are these jobs sort of not as fulfilling for you? Well, at least I got to be with special ops guys. I right. got, you know, I got to go out on, you know, it, all their missions were classified that they went on for the uh, training. I, I was the uh, halo specialist. So if if the unit we were evaluating was going to uh, insert a halo team, then I jumped with the halo team and evaluated uh, their performance and gave them feedback. So, you know, I got to make a lot of jumps um, and go all over the place doing that. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, uh, they asked me if I wanted to go to University of Georgia or they asked me first if I wanted to go back to school and get a graduate degree. So I thought, Okay, you're gonna you're gonna send me to graduate school for 18 months, and that's all I have to do. Well, if, if you're gonna do that, then you, my plan is to get a doctorate. I don't want a master's degree. So I looked around. I found a school that accepted all of your time, even the master's level time, is residency time toward the doctorate. I found a school that had an ROTC program where I could get an assignment after graduate school to stay there, you know, for ROTC, and I could continue to take courses uh, and finish a doctorate while I was there. So the University of Georgia met all those requirements. So 
I went there. I got the doctorate while I was, you know, a ROTC instructor. Um, and then went from there to Command General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. Um, and that's where my career really started to take a change. Uh, I was, I had an opportunity, I, you know, to go through the selection there for uh, Delta. But, you know, the general that was in, uh, in charge there said, no, we're working on a special uh, program. I need somebody with a PhD uh, to help us look at what what does high performance leadership, high performance battle staffs look like as we go into the 21st century? We're working on something called Airland Battle 2000, which is how we're going to fight wars uh, as we go into the 21st century. How we're going to come from you know every dimension, how everyone's going to really be able to talk to each other, work together. Um, essentially, what you saw in the in the Gulf War. Um, in fact, it was even predicted as we were along doing the research and uh, working on everything. It was predicted that the next ground war would go uh, 100 hours continuous before it let up. And if you look at what happened with the Gulf War, once they launched, it went for 100 hours. You know, my brother, Apache pilot, I mean, he would come in to rearm, refuel, jump out, go to the potty, jump back in the cockpit, drink his coffee, eat his sandwich, and back out there. Um, so part of what I was asked to do was figure, how can you do that? How can you keep someone going for 100 hours and, not, and, and just the lack of sleep not kill them? What can you do to keep them effective? So I did uh, a lot of research on that. I went to you know uh, the British Army staff. I briefed them. I went to other you know around to the different divisions and briefed them on here are the techniques. Here's what, what we have to do to to be able to do that. So that was cool. But you know I wanted to go back out and uh, you know play army. I wanted to be back on a team that was doing something. So. At some point there, I, I began to, to realize that's not going to happen anytime soon. So I might as well adapt uh, and be the best I can be at what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a selfish question because uh, I, I hope to head to uh, War College soon, uh, CGSC, the old now it's renamed, but uh, Senior Service College. What, what do I need to know? How do I get the inside track? How am I going to pass that? What do I need to know about War College? Uh, it's, it's different. It's a lot of academics. It's, and what I did was, uh, you know, when I found out that I was going to have to go, um, I, I discovered that uh, they had a master's program there. I already had a master's degree and a doctor, but I thought if they've got a master's program there, I might as well pick up another master's while I'm there. So I contacted a guy who was in, in charge of the program, and I said, look, I want to go ahead and collect the data, collect, and do all my analysis and everything for the research for my master's thesis before I get there. Can I do that? And he said, sure. You bring everything with you. We plug you right into the program. You'll just be ahead of everyone else. And I said, that's great. You know, so I, you know, went out there with all of my data and I uh, got another master's while I was there. So. Uh, anyway, they, um, you know, I had to I had to learn a lot about conventional tactics, con conventional warfare and stuff, because I I had uh, you know not spent much time in that kind of a unit. So, uh, you know, was that difficult to to resist the urge to want to lean on unconventional warfare skills when you're trying to teach yeah. a whole bunch of regular Army O fives and O sixes how to do stuff conventionally? Yeah, it's just. It's, it was just different, you know. I just I saw uh, I saw the ground differently. I saw the use of, of weapons differently. I thought more asymmetrically. I was, you know, it was just different for me. But I had to I had to think more of a mechanized, you know, type unit because at that time the next war was going to be in Europe. It was going to be mechanized. Uh, it, it had nothing to do with getting out in the desert. So, 
Um, you end up retiring after 21 years of service. Your decision or the Army said goodbye to you? It was my decision. I, I had made the decision. Look, <laughs> I, I got a call that said, uh, and I was only about two years out from having the 21 years, and I got a call saying, uh, would you be interested in going back to the University of Georgia? And I said, why would I do that? I said, well, um, we kind of look at, at those assignments now for the professor of military science. It's kind of like a battalion commander uh, assignment. And I said, but why do you really want me to go? And they said, well, they've changed the slot from a 06 slot, you know, full colonel to an 05 lieutenant colonel. Uh, and Georgia is refusing to accept anybody that we send down there that's an 05. And, you know, they're not going to be able to reject you. You've already been there in their program. You graduated from their school. You got two degrees from their school. You already know the whole program. So they can't say no to you. And and they didn't. So I ended up going back there. But my plan was I had started a company um, that I had called High Performing Systems. Uh, I had already started that on the side, and what I would do is I would take leave every once in a while, you know, usually tied in with a weekend, so I could go out and service clients and, and come back. And I decided that <clears throat> I would stay in until the Army uh, and the business conflicted. If right. I couldn't give totally everything the Army wanted, then I needed to get out. So... After a while, it got to the point where the the general that was in charge of cadet command, I mean, he would just, you know, Friday afternoon, he would say, you know, you got to be at Fort Bragg for a meeting tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And I'd already schedule, you know, things with clients over the weekend, and I'd have to cancel them. So after that happened a few times, I decided, you know, I got 21 years in. I might as well go ahead and, and get out and run with the business. Right. So, so I did that. Uh, and your sort of, uh, you know, prediction came true uh, a couple of years after you got out with the Gulf War and you talked about how we fought it. Um, and that was a very conventional sort of warfare uh, that we fought at the time. And we move on to 9-11 and post, you know, in the global war on terror, it is a lot of, unconventional warfare from start to finish. The way we fight now, um, what are some of the big differences that you see compared to what we did through your time in Vietnam and leading up to the Gulf War? Uh, if, I, if I move it to the uh, special ops level, you know, the SEAL teams, uh, the special forces teams that were going out on special ops, uh, the Ranger teams that, that went out Rangers usually went out and supported, you know, SEALs. Um, but they were shorter missions. Uh, a lot of the SEAL team missions, for example, you know, we we plan uh, about 9 o'clock, 2100 tonight. We get on an aircraft. We fly about 30 minutes down uh, to where we're going. We jump off the aircraft. We run in. We kick down a few doors. We find a high-value target that we want. Uh, we drag him back out, throw him on the helicopter. We kill some bad guys while we're there. Uh, get back to base, you know, before midnight. Uh, quick debrief, you know, have have uh, some sandwiches, drink a few beers, go to bed. Uh, get up the next morning and start thinking about, you know, where we might go next. Versus, you know, our we would go out. It was it was almost like we were going after Bin Laden every time we went out. I mean, the number of aircraft that supported the mission that we went out with. We had backup air slicks for uh, the aircraft that we were on. We had Cobra gunships, regular gunships. We had a uh, aircraft orbiting uh, way up there that gave us 24 seven communication. We had the F-4 Phantoms with air cover. We had F-4s attacking ground targets, the A-1Es attacking. I mean, and this was just for a regular old mission. And we would plan to be out there five to seven days. And, you know, we might make it that long, we might not. But, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, load up with 10 magazines and, and run run down the, the street here a little ways and shoot some people and come back. I mean, 
you know, like I said, I carried 50 magazines because I was not going to see any help, any resupply anytime soon. So I had to survive. And a lot of times uh, the way we survived was we had to crawl out and take weapons and ammunition off dead NVA that we had killed and use their weapons against their buddies, you know, because we'd already shot up everything. So, yeah. is, the, is, is the presence of special operations now that it is so forward facing, whereas back when, when you did it, it was, hey, don't say a word about it for 20 years. That's, you know, uh, more unwritten rules now than anything else. But does that bother you at all, the, the, the way special operations is now movies and books and everything else? It, it bothers me. Um, well, with, with the bin, bin Laden raid, I mean, the term SEAL Team 6 uh, was something you heard every once in a while. It was kind of like, you know, in my time, it, it was like you might hear the word SOG, but you didn't know who they were. You didn't know where they were. You didn't know exactly what they were doing. SEAL Team 6 was that mythical uh, part of, of SEALs. Uh, they even changed the they changed the name pretty pretty soon, but people kept using that terminology. But with Bin Laden, all of a sudden we tell who they are. I mean, we're announced here here here's the team that went in and got him. I mean, geez, I mean you you have to worry about their families. You have to worry about you know the people. Uh, you've given away all these secrets about you know how they did it. I mean, we we tell too much now. My opinion: we don't have the operational security that we should have. We tell too much. We want to get it on the news. We want to get it in books. We want to get it, you know, wherever we can. And still, you just go out and do it. You yeah. don't tell anybody. No, capitalism. You know, wasn't a thing back in the day. It is now. So yeah, you kind of. You know, have to uh, without a book or news or, or media, you don't get to make any money off of it. And unfortunately, that uh, in certain cases has superseded the idea of operational security and need to know basis. I mean, I, I'm I'm with you. I'm more of a hey, not everybody needs to know how we operate. Exactly. Uh, for the most part, conventionally, sure, um, that, that you can have as much transparency and everything else as you need. Um, but for the most part, again, there there are dark corners of our military that I'm okay with. Uh, a lot of people may not be. Um, and, and we do owe transparency to taxpayers and citizens about things that go on with our, in our organization that are not up to our standards and up to our values. Um, so from that standpoint, I 100% agree. And in those dark corners that we don't want to talk about, some of those bad things can happen. And they need to be brought to light. But in the same respect, from an operational standpoint, you, you don't need to know everything. Just know, do, do you know how to know those, how the sausage is made. Just know that it's, it's done right. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll, I'll be a, be transparent with you. I'm, I've got a book that I finally decided to write and say, here's what it's like, you know, from a SOG team leader perspective. Here's what I saw. Here's what I experienced. And if you don't want to know what's in those dark corners, don't read this book. There are things in here that they are going to make some people really upset because they don't want to know that kind of stuff. And you know, we, I had a different uh, set of rules of engagement than the guys now have. Right. You know, I, I didn't have to wait on you to pick up a weapon and, and start shooting at me before I could shoot you. I just had to see you. I just had to get my sights on you because everybody, I was in a free fire zone. Everybody there was the enemy. Everyone where I was was the enemy. Uh, you know, so, and my job was to take you out. So that that's a different, you know, I, I met with and had conversations with, with a lot of, you know, the SEAL team guys and special ops guys. Um, you know, it's different. I mean, and they, they find it kind of strange with me because they would say, you mean you didn't have ISR? You couldn't see where the enemy were. You didn't have on a headset where you were being fed all this information about where they were and which way they were moving and how far away from you. I said, no. You know, we moved up on the target, and if somebody popped up, we took them out. You know, you just have to react quick. Um, but, it, I mean, it's different. Um, and, and I'm not 
saying right or wrong. I'm just saying, I think, I think the technology we have today is great. We need to use it, but everyone doesn't need to know what that technology is or how we use it in the, you know, in the special ops role. So, uh, and I know you're on the outside now looking in, I'm just curious from a leadership perspective, uh, where you think the military is now, um, are we better at leadership? Are we worse? We're obviously a bigger force, a more dynamic force. You mentioned the technology. There's so many changes, and sometimes the changes come so fast, you don't have a chance really for anything to take root. But, um, you know, as someone who, who has spent 20-plus years uh, in the leadership profession, and it's what I personally believe is, is my best attribute, um, I, I just wonder if there is a better um, tenant of leadership now than there was back when you were in. I think, and, and again, just from the outside looking in, I think that there are people in the military, uh, like you were when you were in there, uh, who understood leadership, could lead, could lead in combat, could lead people, could lead people in peacetime. But I also think there are a lot of people who can do that. They don't have the mindset. They don't understand how people function, how they're motivated. And I realize, uh, again, just from what I see, that a lot of the, a lot of the young soldiers uh, are a little different today. I mean, if you go through basic training and you have a little yellow card you can hold up and say, drill sergeant, uh, I, I'm just getting a little too hot. I think I'm going to take a break from this next part of the training. Give me a break. Um, I mean, if um, you said you said something about I was crazy when we first started about the SOG missions. If you look at the pictures of those SOG leaders, you'll be shocked with the age. Most of them 21, 22 years old, 23 years old, leading a team into another country going after hundreds and hundreds of bad guys, manipulating just tons of, of air power and calling all this stuff in. And they are kids. Uh, it, you know, from a psychological perspective, we used to think that your prefrontal cortex, which doesn't just hold your cranium up, uh, your, your prefrontal cortex is actually the CEO of your brain. Um, and part of its role is... Uh, to evaluate risk taking and to help you realize, you know, if I do this, I might die. Uh, and we used to think that uh, it matured somewhere around 19, 20 years old. And so that teenagers were crazy and taking risks and things. But, you know, once, once they uh, got to 19 or 20, then they wised up and they stopped doing that. No, it doesn't mature until you're about 29 or 30. So you wave something like you get to go anywhere, do anything, and not have to tell anybody about it. Man, you got a, we got such a cool job for you. Hey, uh, did me. you ever did you ever break that that twenty year promise? I mean, did you hold everything in for twenty years and not say a word to anybody, or did you talk about uh, I, maybe wife, spouse, whatever it may be, cousin, whoever? I. Uh, <laughs> I, I would I would talk in general terms, um, it, but you know, staying in the military kept me around military people, um, and that that was part of I think what helped my transition. Because um, people ask me all the time, "How did you deal with that? How, how did you deal with PTSD or whatever?" And I said, well, in my case, I stayed in. I didn't get out right after Vietnam like most people did. I went, I went to a group of rangers. I mean, everybody there had been in combat. Everybody understood what I was talking about. You know, so I had people I could at least talk to and identify. I didn't have to tell them, you know, I was in SOG. I didn't have to tell them that, you know, I was running missions in North Vietnam or Cambodia or Thailand or wherever. Um, I, I could just talk about combat in general, uh, and they understood what I was saying, I didn't have to, uh, you know, violate the confidentiality of, of what I had done. 
uh, so I, I tried to keep it in the context of the military and special ops and what we were doing, not, and not that SOG was doing a whole bunch of things. You've been so out of the military I, now for uh, over 20 years. What still stays with you from your time in the service? Um, <laughs> um, the most powerful thing was probably that year with SOG. I mean, I, I've been in other types of units, but, uh, you know, the one where every, like you said earlier, every time that chopper lifted off the ground, you knew this, there was a high probability, you know, this was it. And, you know, you're probably not coming back. And, you know, you're watching your friends die every week. I mean, you've got memorial services every week. And you got to remember, SOG was from, lasted from 64 to 72. During that time, there were about 2,000 people who went through um, that, that were assigned to SOG. Out of those 2,000, there was about 500, maybe 600 people who were actually operators, people who actually went out, crossed the border, did the missions. Half or more of those were killed. All the rest of them were wounded one or, or multiple times. You know, so you saw people dying all the time, not coming. I mean, whole teams just disappear. They go out, they send in Team OK moving north, and you never hear from them again, the whole team. So, you know, you're seeing that all the time. So, it, yeah, that kind of burns an image uh, into your mind. And it helps you, I think, put put things in perspective. So... You know, if I'm having a bad day about something, I can always think back and say, man, I've had a lot worse day than this. <laughs> I've had a lot worse day than this. Uh, and I and some of the, the training I do, I've got a uh, an actual photograph of myself and two of my team members hanging on ropes under a helicopter. We'd been picked up on strings and then we're coming into a fire base. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, we get drugged through the canopy getting out. People are, you know, NVA are shooting at us. I'm hitting the radio. I've got all this stuff going on. I know my, my two guys are both hit and bleed, slowly bleeding out. I know we've got 45 minutes to an hour to get to a place where it's safe to set us on the ground and put us in a helicopter. I'm flying at 7,000 feet hanging on a rope underneath a helicopter at over 100 miles an hour. I'm watching an anti-aircraft fire coming up at me. Uh, I'm oscillating some back and forth. I can see my rope on the edge of the floor of the helicopter, rubbing back and forth, starting to fray. And I'm thinking, it, <laughs> is it going to cut in two before I get to where I'm going? My radio is dead. I can't call the, the pilot and tell him I've got a little issue going on here. Um, so I, I have all of that. You know, I'm freezing to death. You know, I'm used to 100, 110 degree heat at 7,000 feet, you know, at 100 miles an hour. It's cold. And I was soaking wet to start with. So now I'm freezing. Both of my legs are asleep. I can't feel either one of them because the, the, the harness I have on has cut the circulation off. And I'm thinking, hmm. I hear people sometimes complain about their commute to work. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, I'm pretty excited right now hanging under this helicopter because in about 45 minutes, if that rope doesn't break, I'll be able to, to get on the ground and, and be set inside the helicopter. Just, I mean, I'm just commuting back from the office. <laughs> and, I've, and I've had worse commutes than this. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So and, you can put things in perspective and say, I'm stuck in traffic in Atlanta. I mean, I don't want to do this every day. Nobody. Well, I say nobody's shooting at me. You could get shot at in Atlanta. So <laughs> <laughs> don't we know it? Uh, so, uh, don't but, we know it? Yeah. But let me. I wanted to ask you one more thing here, um, because you went through Vietnam. Uh, you saw the end of it uh, and clearly how it went on. And then now. 
uh, all these years later, we're watching the end of Afghanistan and sort of play out in similar fashion. Did it, did anything sort of resonate with you? Did, yes. did emotions and things stir up? Tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, because I, I've seen this before. I've seen it before. I've seen the same pictures. I've seen the same kinds of things happen. And I, I do a lot of work uh, with vets, um, particularly vets that, you know, combat vets who are maybe struggling uh, with PTSD. I do a lot, you know, around the suicide prevention. And, you know, when all of that started, the calls just, you know, dramatically increased with guys struggling uh, with, you know, to question everything they've done because of what, what they see happening. Um, you know, I still get, you know, a lot of calls. Um, but at least, you know, I had a little bit of perspective to look at it with. I had seen us pull out. I had seen the way we pulled out. Um, and there, there's some similarities there. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to get political, but, you know, we did not do it right. Yeah. Either time, yeah. particularly You're this probably time. not going to get much of an argument from me or, or anybody listening in the audience. I mean, it's yeah. anybody with a military background knows that uh, strategically the execution of the withdrawal uh, was bungled at best. I, I joked around repeatedly. I could have got four RTC cadets to come up with a better plan than what they did. Um, you violated some of those basic premises of stuff that we, we learn uh, from day one. Hi, established security. Uh, you gave all that away from day one. I mean, you, you know, it's your priority. Your first priority of work went out the window and all of a sudden the rest of the plan was formulated. So uh, again, we we could do a whole dissertation on this whole thing and, and with good reason. And hopefully, you know, uh, in the big picture, the government will do the right thing and, and get to a, a resolution of how way, how, why it was done the way it was and uh, come up with a, yes, there was a, a, a other viable options um, because that's a key level of accountability. I think that's owed uh, all of us, uh, military or non-military, I think it's owed to everybody. But um, it, it is noteworthy that there were so many veterans, both Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and Vietnam veterans who uh, saw those events play out and had a, had a, had a Band-Aid ripped off. An old wound got exposed again. Um, and as I say repeatedly, I just remind all those people who are still here, you have the tools how to get through all this. You know how to do it. You've done it already. You just sort of need a reminder to go through that same process again and not let it get the better of you. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've shared something similar to that even, even before, um, you know, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I mean, we had COVID, uh, you know, COVID hit and all of a sudden the rules changed. And, you know, I was speaking on Veterans Day to uh, a group of veterans, and, and I, I said to them, this is not your first radio or rodeo. You guys have deployed before. And what happens when you deploy? All the rules change. All of a sudden, you have, you, you have a wire. You have a boundary. You can't go out there. If you go out there, you've got to have protection. Whether it's a ballistic vest or a mask or whatever, you've got to have protection. Uh, you eat different food, you, you know, so everything changes, but you guys have all been through this and you survive it and you're back. Help your buddies, help your family. We can get through this. I mean, we might be a little short on toilet paper for a little while, but, you know, we'll be OK. You know, hang in there. And, well, Dick, it, look, it's an amazing story. Um, and again, the book, if anybody is interested in grabbing it, uh, is titled the stress effect, why smart leaders make dumb decisions and what to do about it. Just a phenomenal 21 years uh, beyond a wealth of experience uh, and information. I and mean, obviously downloaded throughout uh, all your years of teaching. And, and that has a, a profound effect on the rest of the force because that information is now in the hands of people who can use it uh, for their careers and going forward. So certainly, again, thank you for spending so much time with us and, uh, and sharing your story. But we certainly appreciate you, uh, you being here with us. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about some of it. And I appreciate your service and everything that you've done and your audience. And, um, you know, we're all in this together and we will get through it. So thank Amen. you. Dick Thompson, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. 
If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Yeah.